Okay, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Kim Wheaton. I'm the director of the Center for the Study of Inequality, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you today to this webinar on uh, sexual assault on college campuses. We're absolutely delighted to have Jennifer Hirsch and Seamus Khan join us, the authors of Sexual Citizens. They are both professors at Columbia University. Uh, we also have two moderators today who are going to be leading the conversation with Seamus and Jennifer. Uh, Celine Reynolds, who is a uh, Cornell Presidential Postdoctoral Fellow and an affiliate of the Center for the Study of Inequality and a Yale Sociology PhD. Um, and Nina Cummings, who is the Director of Cornell's uh, Program for uh, Sexual Assault Prevention and Victim Advocacy, um, working through Cornell Health. I just want to take a minute to uh, recognize our co-sponsors. Uh, so the primary sponsor is the Center for the Study of Inequality, um, but we also are partnering with uh, Cornell Student Campus Life, uh, the Division of Human Resources, uh, Cornell Faculty Develop the Office of Faculty Development and Diversity, uh, Cornell Health, and the Departments of Sociology and Feminist Gender and Sexuality Studies. So thanks to all of our, of our, all of our co-sponsors. I'm going to go ahead and turn over the mic, as it were, to Celine, who is going to introduce our two speakers and give you a little bit of a sense of the format for today's session. All right. Thank you, Kim. So the discussion will follow a Q&A format today, and we'll have time for questions from the audience at the end. The chat function has been disabled, so please go ahead and submit your questions to the Q&A function, and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible. Um, Laura Weiss is going to help us call the question. She works as a sexual violence education coordinator at Cornell Health, so thanks to Laura. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. Jennifer Hirsch is Professor of Sociomedical Sciences at Columbia's Mailman School of Public Health. Seamus Khan is Professor of Sociology at Columbia. And together they are co-authors of Sexual Citizens, a landmark study of sex, power, and assault on campus, published by W.W. W. Norton. The book details the findings from Columbia's Sexual Health Initiative to Foster Transformation, or SHIFT for short. Um, the project was co-directed by Jennifer and clinical psychologist Claude Ann Mellons. A review in Science recently described sexual citizens as, quote, profoundly eye-opening, and we are thrilled to welcome Jennifer and Seamus to Cornell's virtual community. So to get us started, can you tell us about the SHIFT study and why you decided to write Sexual Citizens and who uh, you wanted to reach with the book? Yes, well, first, thank you for, for having us here in your virtual space. We had so looked forward to our visit to Ithaca, but um, it's great to be here, um, here on Zoom. Um, so I'll start with a story. Um, when we interviewed Austin, he was a very engaging interview subject. He, um, the story about Austin and his girlfriend is sort of the only really hot sex scene in the book. Um, on a, you know, the 4th of July, they were alone in an apartment. Um, they were going to see the fireworks. They made their own fireworks. I will leave the rest to your imagination. Um, and he was a commit. He was committed to being a good lover. He even had nicknames that he'd made up for the kinds of orgasms that his girlfriend had. So he seemed like um, what in my family we would describe as a menchie guy. He seemed like a nice guy. And um, yet he also, in that interview, told us a story about sexually assaulting someone um, early in freshman year. He had been shuffled off to um, someone else's room so his roommate could be alone with his girlfriend. And there was a girl in that room uh, who was drunk and she mumbled that she didn't want to do anything. And like that in itself should give us pause. Why should you have to assert to a stranger when you're in your own bed that you don't want to be touched? Um, and yet he got in bed with her and started to touch her body. And then, then he stopped himself and in the beginning of the in the beginning when he described that in the interview he said it was a weird experience but then later we said well what's sexual assault and he said well sexual assault is any time that there is unwanted non-consensual sexual touching and then he he paused and his eyes welled up and he said fuck me like he just he couldn't put together what he had done with who he had become and we wrote sexual citizens because most of the conversation around campus sexual assault has been about the campus as a hunting ground or about how to fix adjudication. And in Sexual Citizens, our focus is on how that night could have been prevented, how Austin, what Austin would have needed to know that that was a wrong thing to do and to not have done it. Um, 
So we're, we're sexual citizens, we're trying to change the conversation to a conversation about prevention where it's clear that sexual assault is not just a campus problem, it's an everyone problem. And that part of the way forward involves thinking about power in a way that recognizes that gender inequalities produce sexual assault, but also that goes beyond only thinking about gender as part of the, the context of assault. Great. Was there anyone in particular that you wanted to reach with the book? I think we wanted to reach, um, you know, the book is, it's the product of, um, you know, a part of the large shift study. So the ethnographic portion of the study that Jennifer and I co-directed. Um, uh, and, you know, with that study, we wrote uh, over a dozen paper, maybe, maybe papers and for academic audiences. But from the very start, Jennifer and I really wanted to reach non-academic audiences as well. Um, you know, it's a big book. It's, uh, you know, over 400 pages with lots of footnotes and citations, but the book is written, we hope, in a way that would be accessible to people who are about to head off to college, to young people, you know, who are just finishing up high school, to parents of children of all ages, and to college administrators. And so, you know, Jennifer and I really want to be part of a academic conversation, and sexual citizens is partially that, but it's also part of, we want it to be part of a national conversation, a national conversation um, which changes our perspective a little bit on sexual assault, thinking about it less as, you know, the result of sociopaths. Um, don't get us wrong, there are some sociopaths out there, but there aren't that many of them. And more a product of how our communities are organized. And so, you know, to try and get the public to think about sexual assault as something socially organized and part of um, sort of a public health crisis, um, or maybe not a crisis, but an emergency, uh, something, and something that we could do something about. And we wanted to give parents and kids and administrators a language of understanding, a way to think about and make sense of why sexual assaults are happening. So now I'm gonna ask you a few questions about key constructs in the book. So sexual citizenship, sexual projects, and sexual geographies, and, their, and the relationship of these three different constructs to sexual violence on college campuses. Can you talk a little bit more about how these ideas intersect with each other and, and what the ideas are? Right, I think we'll start with what the ideas are and then we'll get to the intersection part. So sexual citizenship um, refers to people's understanding of their own right to choose sexual experiences and their recognition that other people have that same right. So think about Austin. In that moment, he was failing to recognize that the girl whose body he was touching had the right to sexual self-definition. He was thinking about her more as an object or a tool to realize um, his desire than as, or, and really as like a way of, of, of ridding himself of the inexperience that he was so anxious about. Um, he wasn't thinking about her as an equivalent self-determining person. So that's sexual citizenship. Um, sexual projects ask the question, which you might think is like the kind of question that only an academic would ask, but it's actually um, not a question that only an academic would ask, we think, um, of what sex is for. Um, you know, you might think, well, sex is for pleasure or for babies, but none of the, the students we spoke with were interested in having babies then, and a lot of the sex that they had was not very pleasurable. And so instead, um, by understanding what they were trying to accomplish through sex, um, we understand uh, how those situations are produced. Again, think back to Austin. And um, his sexual project in that moment was ridding himself of inexperience, was just gaining experience. I mean, he wasn't looking really for pleasure. He was really just trying to figure out sex. Um, and I'll let Seamus uh, talk about sexual geographies. Yeah, sexual geographies um, is the idea that space matters. Um, uh, so instead of thinking about space as just a backdrop um, where people do or don't have sex, um, we think about it as a critical player or a critical actor in what it is that they're doing. And so, um, you know, the, the insight is that we should think not just about people and their characteristics, but about the broader social contexts that they um, uh, live in and that they navigate. 
So, you know, think for a moment about two young people hanging out. Uh, maybe they're at a bar or at a party and they want to go back somewhere private. They want to go somewhere private. And so they go back to one of their rooms. Um, when they open the door to that room, typically they're sort of, they can see four pieces of furniture, a desk, a bureau, a chair, and a bed. And if they're going to sit together in that room, where are they going to sit? Well, it's kind of awkward not to sit together, but it also, beds have social meanings. Um, and, you know, the, the idea or the insight is that that bed produces certain kinds of futures to be more likely than others. Now, is that a direct cause of sexual assault? Well, that's not really what we're arguing. But what we are arguing is that in order to make sense of campus life and campus sexual assault, we need to think about the ways that space are experienced and controlled by students. And finally, what that means is looking critically at power and inequality, because space isn't just available to everyone. If we think about Greek life and national Greek life rules throughout the United States, we realize that you know, sororities are not allowed to serve alcohol at parties or allowed to have our alcohol in their spaces, whereas fraternities are. This is a spatial rule that effectively gives men control over the distribution um, of alcohol on college campuses that have Greek life for those who want to participate in it. And that's something that sort of empowers men in um, critically important ways. Uh, so we need to think about who controls space. Um, in the book, we write about how that control over space is racialized, um, uh, how it's based in class dynamics, how it's based in gender dynamics, and how all of that influences experiences of both sex and sexual assault. And so just to pick up on the question of, of intertwining, I think that you could sum up the book by saying in terms of recommendations that um, the path forward needs to involve reimagining sexual geographies, helping young people develop clarity about their sexual projects, and promoting the sexual citizenship of, of everyone. So the, the sexual projects is a more internal part and the, the, the ones over which we have levers as communities are is the promotion of sexual citizenship and the transformation of the geographies. Great, so in, that's a great segue to the next in relation to the sexual projects. Uh, in your book, you acknowledge and you advocate for comprehensive sex education starting in early childhood. That will foster the respect for bodily autonomy, for the values, it will build the empathy that you describe. So given that many who are attending this event um, are working and meeting with students, actually, I'm sure we have college age students um, on this um, webinar. What are your thoughts about how to approach prevention education 18 plus years later than is optimal for those of us who, who work closely with students? And what kind of guidance might you be able to give us in terms of sexual experiences that would benefit those who are listening and who work closely with the students? I mean, I think we have to, you know, when students show up on college, at, at college and their writing isn't very good, they have freshman writing. And you can't teach calculus if people don't have arithmetic. And so I think that we need to acknowledge the level of sexual ignorance that is common among even the very bright and talented students coming onto the Cornell campus and provide options for non-embarrassing online remedial sex ed. No one is gonna raise their hand when you say, who didn't get sex ed? Because that is mortifying, right? Um, but I think that we need to meet them where they are, which is, as one young woman described, not even knowing where her holes were. So where they are for a lot of them um, is not where they need to be. Um, you can't start with consent because that's like lesson seven. You have to start with, with the basics and not the basics about plumbing, but the basics about relationships. Yeah, I mean, you know, even if you think of the sex ed, when, when Jennifer says the relationship, the basics about plumbing, you know, there's such a biologization, that's probably not a word, but um, of sex ed. Uh, so people learn about things like ovaries and fallopian tubes in the uterus. And like, you know, that's important, but it's not absolutely essential for a lot of sex ed, um, um, which is about relationships and which is about what it means to treat one another well, what it means to fundamentally respect other people. 
And I would say that, you know, sex ed should be, you know, the arguments that Jennifer and I make in the book is that early sex ed isn't about sex. It's about respect for bodily autonomy, um, an understanding that people have the right to their corporeal space, um, that you have an obligation to recognize their fundamental human dignity. And so, you know, I think that the other thing is to think about how sex ed can be tied to a broader set of moral lessons about what it means to be a person in the world. So rather than think about sex ed as a standalone thing that people get, which is about sex, what we need to do is tie um, understandings of sex and sexual experiences to our broader lessons of, you know, um, community morality uh, uh, so that the lessons that students have gotten um, are suddenly connected to the lessons that they're also and newly getting about sex. The final I just want to oh, wait, yeah. go ahead, Seamus. Oh, no, I was also going to say just how important this is. So, um, uh, you know, that, um, that these can't be just lessons that are about, you know, concepts. So, you know, when, if you think we're trying on that Austin interview a lot, but if you think back to that Austin interview for a moment, um, Austin knew, was he had learned what consent and what assault were. He just hadn't connected that lesson with his own history and with his own practice. And so it's super important, not just to teach students conceptually these sets of things, but to actually teach them skills on how to do it, how to practice it. And to emphasize how important that is, um, as part of the broader research project of SHIFT, there was a quantitative based study as well. And Jennifer's husband, John Centelli, led a paper um, uh, as part of that study which showed that um, for women who had had comprehensive sex ed that included practicing refusal skills, they were half as likely to be raped in college. I'll just repeat that because it's such a profound effect. For women who had had comprehensive sex, sex education that included practicing refusal skills, they were half as likely to be raped in college. Now, don't get us wrong. We don't want to say, we're not saying that like, it's all on women and they need to practice refusal skills. It's, you know, comprehensive sex ed may also um, reduce the likelihood that people commit assaults, which is equally, if not more important. But the emphasis there on practice and making sure that people actually do the things that they're supposed to do, practicing saying no, practicing refusing sex is really important and should be part of the ways that we teach this. Great, thanks. So Seamus, you, you um, spoke about a, a public health approach to this problem and certainly at Cornell, we do take a comprehensive public health approach to it. And then Jennifer, you mentioned consent education. So I'd like to ask, um, you know, consent education is, Jennifer, as you said, is, is less than seven and yet it remains the cornerstone of prevention work on college campuses. Some of that are the mandates. But still, even um, our experience shows that students themselves truly believe in the power of consent education, despite the contradictory evidence that after 30 years of it, the prevalence of campus sexual assault remains pretty much the same. So, um, and oh, frankly, some would also argue consent education is doing harm, that it is providing a misguided sense of security to students. They assume that their peers who attend these programs understand the importance of it and that the no's will be respected. And of course, we know that that is simply not the case. So given that consent education, particularly in heteronormative sexual encounters, is insufficient for the change that I think we all you know, are looking for, and based on what you heard from the students in your study, what would you recommend to students themselves that they might be able to do instead to sort of further the constructs that um, you outlined? And what would you say to them that would be proactive but help them go deeper than the consent education that they seem so tied to? So I'll tell another story that I think illustrates what we would recommend. Um, and this is sort of, the paradigmatic cis-hetero um, assault story that people imagine when they think about campus sexual assault. Lucy was um, a freshman and she arrived on campus eager to gain sexual experience. She wanted to, to kiss some boys, to party, to lose her virginity. She'd gone to a, a very sheltered boarding school and um, so early in freshman year she and her, one of the, her hallmates went out to a bar they met some seniors that felt thrilling. Um, 
one of the seniors invited Lucy back to his, his frat house. That also felt thrilling. They stumbled up Amsterdam Avenue, um, both pretty drunk, but she was drunker than he was because he had more experience drinking and he was a lot bigger than she was. Um, he invited her into the fraternity. She went upstairs. He asked her if she would like a drink. The alcohol was kept on the next floor because they're not supposed to have alcohol. So of course, the, what they do is not not have it. They just hide it upstairs. And so, and then um, eventually she went up to his bedroom and um, they started making out. And then he started to take her pants off. And she said, no, don't. And he said, it's okay. And then he raped her. And so like, you, if you think about that story only from the point of the interpersonal interaction and like, what was he thinking? Then you think, well, okay, Scott was a terrible person. That is the only takeaway from that. But if instead you think that maybe Scott believed that she was supposed to say no and he was supposed to advance a sexual interaction because he really didn't, he really believed that rape myth. And he was unaware of his power. And so I think that this is, this is the thing that students need to do, um, is to recognize their social power. So in that interaction, he had three years on her. He had probably 40 pounds. He was in a space that he controlled, surrounded by people he knew, on a campus where he knew how to act during a time in the year when sort of the prime directive for, for incoming students is to not do anything stupid. And so that is a lot of layered forms of power and the most charitable interaction that we could give, the most charitable interpretation of that interaction is that Scott failed to recognize his own power. That when Lucy froze, he didn't understand that she was not consenting because he didn't see how overpowering he was. Um, so if you, if you move, and not that people are not responsible for their own behavior, but I think that, you know, most assaults are committed by heterosexual men. And so learning to see their own power without thinking that it makes them bad people, but understanding that those power disparities put them in a position where they can hurt people through sex. So that's the thing that they need to do. But then I think that there's the other part of that is is what we need to do because really sexual the message of, about sexual citizens is that we can't just lay this on the kids that there is so much work that we as a society need to do and so you know if you think about driving which is another pretty dangerous thing that young people do they don't just grab the keys and like figure it out on their own when they're drunk um and we don't just say to them like stop at stop signs and or stop at red lights and sort of assume that that will be enough to drive safely. And that's what consent education is. It's the stop sign and the red lights and all of the other complexity of how to have sex in a way that doesn't hurt other people. Nobody is teaching them that. And so that's where the gap is. Like they, we, we can't magic our way into young people knowing how to have sex without hurting people unless we teach them. So this is a great segue to our next question, which is about the role of power in sexual assault. Can you say a little bit more about how race, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, and other identities influence the likelihood of sexual assault and how those, how those with marginalized ident identities experience power and sexual citizenship differently? Yeah, that's great. And it's a lot. I mean, Jennifer and I build on, um, a long tradition of understanding sexual assault in relationship to power. And for the most part, that tradition is about gender and power. So it understands sexual assault as being related to gender and dynamics of power. And we don't disagree with that. We think that sexual assault is in part explained by gender and dynamics of power. But what we also point to is the many other forms of power that exist on college campuses, that gender and power are not the only power inequality. There's also race and sexuality and, as you said, ability. Um, and all of these power dynamics are important. So I'm going to tell a couple stories on this that might hopefully um, highlight it. Charisma was um, a Black and Latina woman who described being really uncomfortable with um, what she described as like the white space of campus, that she experienced campus as primarily a white space. And you know, when we asked her what she meant by that, she was like, you know, she described like 
fratty parties where the guys drank too much, couldn't really dance and listen to terrible music. And um, for her, like none of those things were interesting. And also for her, she talked about how, you know, those men didn't, weren't really particularly attracted to her. Um, they didn't, you know, they didn't really see her as a sexual person in the same way that they did others. And so um, Charisma ended up leaving campus to go find someone to, you know, potentially be with. And this guy that she met um, uh, through her roommate, and it's a long story that we tell in, in the book, and she ends up getting assaulted in that encounter. Um, that assault of Charisma's, we can't understand just through her experience of her gender. We also have to think about how the racialized spaces of campus sort of pushed her away from campus into a place, a space controlled by the man who assaulted her. Um, in that sense, our, sec our idea of sexual geographies is really important. Charisma also, when she got out to, the, the guy she met was like way out in Brooklyn and she'd taken the train out there. And for those of you who don't know, getting from Morningside Heights to Brooklyn is like, it's not close. It's like, and if it's at, late at night, it's like, really not close. It's about an hour and a half to get there. And so, and you know, the subways were kind of not really running and it was pouring rain and there were all these problems. And she was from um, a poor background and couldn't like just open up her phone and grab an Uber home, right? And so she also felt somewhat trapped in that space. In that sense, class matters in Charisma's story. Um, another story is that of Adam. Adam was um, uh, from the Midwest and from a pretty conservative and religious family who really denied his sexuality. Um, and he was super excited to get to New York City. He was thrilled to be in New York and, and, and at Columbia because it was sort of a gay mecca for him. Um, but he didn't like the gay culture of New York. He you know, still had this influence of his family and really valued relationships. And um, when he was talking to us about his boyfriend, he was super happy to be in a relationship, but he talked to us about how his boyfriend was really forceful at times about sex and how um, uh, he described one night when his boyfriend came home really drunk and in Adam's words, he basically raped me. And understanding that experience of rape for Adam is in part understanding the precarity of his sexuality and how the institutions that he'd grown up within, his family, the places that he'd come from, um, really put him at risk. And it's important to know that uh, LGBTQIA students have some of the highest rates of assault of any group of students on campus. Um, and then a final um, note, and you know, all of this is, is a little, it's quite depressing, but um, I think it's important to recognize um, every single black woman we spoke to told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. And it bears repeating that every single black woman we spoke to told us a story of unwanted sexualized touching. Now, it's not just their gender that explains that experience. It's also um, racism. Uh, racism where their fellow students didn't really respect their bodily autonomy. They didn't really respect their ability to, or their right to control their own bodies. Um, and it was a, that racialized disrespect is really important. So to take a spec, step back, Celine, like what we're sort of, talking about here is how multiple forms of power inequality put people at risk. And, you know, the big argument that runs through sexual citizens is that equality is a sexual assault prevention strategy, that struggles for equality and fighting for greater conditions of equality, meaning equality over space, um, equality of racial relations, equality of gender relations, quality for um, LGBTQIA plus uh, students, these things will help, we think, we argue with sexual assault because from our perspective, when you look at the multiple different forms of inequality on campus, again and again and again, you see that those on the more um, dominated position of those systems of inequality experience higher rates of assault than others. And so as a community, we need to be deeply committed, not just to, and this returns to Nina's question, like not just to consent education as part of our program of prevention, but to think like, how do we create campus spaces of equality as a way to try and reduce assaults on campus and maybe reduce a bunch of other things as well. 
You must have been anticipating our next question, <laughs> Seamus, because that's exactly what we want to ask a little bit more about. Um, you did describe it uh, before the concept of sexual geographies and how the spaces we create as a campus community can uh, directly impact the student's sexual encounters. Um, here at Cornell, we're actually in the middle of a massive residential building project that's going to provide additional spaces um, to our students to live on campus. So I'm wondering if you could build on that idea of sexual geographies and talk a little bit more about how campuses should be considering spaces. What is the ideal that we should be aspiring to, including, you know, cooperative housing and what are those opportunities for prevention that might lie within the planning stage for new residential communities? We love that question. Um, you know, in because we imagine a campus with spaces where first year students who are um, uh, people of color and who are queer and who are women um, and other minoritized or less powerful identities can host their own parties so that they're not funneled into spaces controlled by students who are more powerful than they are along any of those social gradients. So I think that creating spaces where students can um, produce the kind of social life that they want as opposed to um, having to fold themselves into this, you know, what is clearly some people's dream of college, um, uh, the Greek life experience, but is really not everyone's dream. But then if the best party spaces belong to Greek life. Um, so I think you can't break the grip of Greek life without investing in spaces that other kinds of students can control. Um, but we also saw that there's other kinds of spaces that you can invest in. So I think students from minoritized groups need spaces where they can connect with each other um, and draw comfort and support from that. And then campuses are need to be spaces of encounter. And so we can engineer those encounters by creating spaces where everyone comes together. You know, the, for most students, certainly at Columbia, it is the most um, diverse institution that, that most of the students will ever be a part of because they come from segregated communities and they will go back into a very segregated labor force. And so really taking advantage of that through um, architecture and social engineering, like making spaces where everybody has a, st has a stake and everybody feels at home. Um, and then students need spaces uh, for privacy, right? I mean, when, when we allocate all the single rooms to upperclassmen, you funnel younger students into those single rooms for sex. And so my ideal dorm configuration for a freshman is, you know, four singles with a common living room or even, you know, a cooking space. The reasons, you know, we say, we say to students, don't drink on an empty stomach, but you can't bring alcohol into the dining room and you can't cook in your dorm room. And so we are producing an environment where they kind of are more likely than not to drink on an empty stomach. So we have, we have I mean, how much time do you have to talk about this? We have a lot of suggestions about um, the way space, which as you know, is the most powerful lever that campuses have, um, the way space can produce a safer context. I'll just layer onto that. I mean, Jennifer sort of pointed to this, like there is such a naturalization that older students get better space on campus, right? Like as you become a senior, you have access to better space and control over better space than when you're a freshman. But like, if we think for a moment about what that does, it ends up funneling the least experienced students out of the spaces that they control, particularly if we police um, their consumption of alcohol and other kinds of things in those spaces, into spaces that are controlled by more senior students. And like, we effectively like funnel them into risk by design. And we might ask, how do we change that system? How do we not funnel them into risk by design, but instead funnel them into safety by design? So related to the concept of sexual geographies is the broader legal framework that guides how universities manage sexual misconduct on campus. So Title IX, the Clery Act, VAWA, et cetera. So I recognize that these laws and universities' responses to them aren't the focus of the shift study, but 
your deep knowledge of how the problem of sexual assault unfolds on the ground can and I think should be used to improve how schools address it. So if you had the chance, how would you redesign the specialized bureaucracies that many universities have developed to address sexual assault in compliance with these laws? So I kind of want to hear your answer to this, Celine, because you're like <laughs> literally the world's expert on this right. topic. And so I'm a little nervous to like even say anything. And for those of you who are listening along, you know, Celine's own project is on the, you know, organization and response um, of colleges and universities to things like Title IX and in particular in relationship to the exact thing that we're talking about. So I'm like, I'm like short of citing your own work. I don't know. That's why I asked you. That's why I really want to know. <laughs> Uh, uh, but even so, I mean, I think it's important for us to recognize that we're not going to punish our way out of this problem or really any other problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it might be helpful for us to, to sort of have a quick reminder of the challenges of mass incarceration and the challenges and the social consequences of mass incarceration. And I'm not saying we're not close to a mass incarceration moment sexual assault. So like, don't get me wrong on, on that. I'm not suggesting that we're anywhere near that. Let's remember that the vast majority of assaults never get reported. When they do get reported, it's not like the, you know, the rate of finding people culpable is super high. So, you know, let's be clear. But still, in general, our tool has been adjudication, punishment, and if we get it right, we're going to solve the and so, as you know, Celine, like our whole response is like, well, we're kind of punt on that question and instead focus on prevention. But let me just highlight a few things that I think um, we are, you know, maybe a little bit more optimistic about. Um, so, you know, we advocate um, um, lightly, but in the conclusion of the book, for a restorative justice framework um, to think about victim-centered approaches where the acknowledgement of harm is really important. And um, right now in our adjudication system, it's really based upon a system of law, which is by design an adversarial system. Two people argue vigorously their position and a, you know, an impartial party reasons through those vigorous arguments. And like, you know, this is like the enlightenment in front of us where we think that like reason and making arguments is gonna save the day. And, you know, our perspective is like, well, you know, most assaults happen in contexts where the interactions were consensual until they weren't. Um, so it's pretty rare to have an assault, um, uh, uh, not exceptionally rare if you think of unwanted touching, but like where the two parties didn't have some degree of sexual encounter that was fully consensual before it was. Most assaults happen in contexts where people are deeply embedded with one another. Think about Adam. Um, Adam kind of knew, I think, that his, his boyfriend had raped him, but he said he basically raped me. And to him, the relationship was so valuable that he didn't want to think about it that way. And so I think as institutions, what we have to do is start asking ourselves, you know, what are the different ways that we can deal with this, which isn't just about adjudication, where people can get feedback on the kinds of partners that they are being with other people without necessarily fear of punishment. Um, sometimes people are having a really difficult time with their partner. They don't necessarily want their partner punished, but they might want something to facilitate a conversation about how those interactions are going. Um, and so I think like opening up the range of things where people don't have to just, you know, where people are sometimes profoundly unkind to one another in sexual encounters and thinking about like opening up space for discussions about that unkindness without actually having to worry about it being an accusation of assault is, I think, some of the places that we push to, the suggestions that we would offer. So building on that and, and thinking even more broadly, do you see this legal framework as an opportunity that can be used to address campus sexual assault more effectively, or do you see it as more of an obstacle? I mean, I think we really, I'm very interested in your answer to this question mm -hmm. and our the problem has been the problem of campus sexual assault has pretty much been owned by lawyers and psychologists. 
And, you know, so bringing a social scientific public health framework, which looks at um, in an empirical way at the institutional context and at the social context and in a way that goes beyond sort of a nod to like rape culture or toxic masculinity, but like getting very granular about the precise dimensions of social, of, of social context, because once we can identify them, we can modify them, right? So that's, it, I think that that's for us really the way forward. And as Seamus noted, you know, such a small percentage of um, assaults are adjudicated. Obviously, it's important that they be adjudicated um, in ways that are, that don't cause more damage uh, to people who've already been harmed and that are fair. And we're going to stay in our lane and let the lawyers figure that out and, and really try to shift the bigger conversation um, going upstream to to prevention. I mean, I've, I've you know, my the way I've described my whole career is trying to get people to stop thinking about these problems one penis at a time. And so we're just going to keep pushing that. Great. I can share my answer with you after. Yes, please do. <laughs> Why do you need um, so, so as you consider the wealth of data that you collected, was there anything that you had to, t to cut from the book um, or specific findings that you wish you would have been able to include? I don't think there was a ton that we cut. I think, I mean, maybe Jennifer does. Um, I always think that there's like more we wish we would have done. And, you know, you asked earlier about disability and, you know, one of the forms of uh, inequality that we don't attend to at all really in the book is disability. And we know from national level data that disability is strongly associated with assault, that people who, ex who have disabilities experience assault at higher rates. And so I wish we could have looked into that a, a little bit more. I wish, um, you know, we don't look at the varieties of experience among, say, Asian students. And so we really try in the book to, to sort of give a strong intersectional framework. We don't talk about a general experience and then the experience of um, sexual minorities and racial ethnic minorities and other groups. It's like, all the stories are woven together throughout the whole thing, but we don't sort of open up uh, those experiences, the different kinds of experiences of Asian students. And so I kind of wish we could do that. And then I think the final thing I wish we could have done is that, you know, in the book and in, across the entire project, we argue that the institutional dimensions are so important, that institutional factors are really essential for understanding assault there's kind of a design problem for our study from this. And this is like a little wonky, but like we don't have any institutional level variation. So how do we generate institutional level explanations absent institutional level variation? And the less wonky insight to that is like, it'd be great to have comparative contexts where people kind of drew upon some of the stuff that we did and talked about how, you know, the sexual projects, citizenship and geography it's very different in some spaces than, than others. So like Cornell is a really distinct campus in terms of the multiple different kinds of schools, being both a land grant institution and a private institution, being located in Ithaca. I mean, it has all of this stuff that's quite different than the Columbia Barnard New York City context. And I wish like, and you know, what you guys have been capable of, um, uh, thanks to your administration and shout out to Kim here as well, Others in terms of like the COVID testing and response, like I just don't imagine that would even have been possible in New York City um, where we were. Being able to capture that variation and what it might explain would be really great. And it was just something we couldn't do. Um, Jennifer, was there anything on the floor you think we left on cut on the floor that you wish we had talked about? No, I, I think, um, you know, we had some pretty funny interchanges with our editor about the way students talk. And there were definitely moments where he was like, you cannot put that in the book. And we were like, John, that is what they said. And I think that he, because he's a Columbia grad and his son is a Columbia grad, he, um, he, felt, he, he worried that that was undignified. But I'm like, no, that student really did say that he wanted to give good dick. So like, that's going in the book. So we, because we, I mean, um, 
the book is, you know, obviously hard in many ways to read, but it's very vivid with student stories. So it, it pulls back the curtain on what it's like to be a college student. Um, uh, I've gotten notes from grandmothers who have bought it for their grandchildren and many notes from young people who said that they feel more prepared for college having read it. And so we really wanted to um, to maintain the vividness of the language to enhance the readability. So it sounds like you have a lot of other work you want to do, Seamus. So we'll make room at Cornell for you. You can come join us anytime and do all that work. I'm not going anywhere without Jennifer, so. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely have room for both. <laughs> um, so um, actually you mentioned this peculiar year we're in, the year of COVID. And so finally, the final question that I have is actually, um, you know, during this year when encounters do pose these actually additional and different threats to the student health and safety because of COVID, um, I know on our campus we've been encouraging students to use the time to take a pause and really think constructively about their values and their preconceptions and the assumptions they have about being sexual, all the, the sexual project stuff that you refer to. So based on your understanding of students' sexual lives and, and what they shared and all the data you collected, if you're willing to speculate, I'm wondering when we look back on this current time with COVID, will we see opportunities lost for those of us who are working with the students or you know, can we hope that students may actually reevaluate their sexual projects or reconsider the risks associated with the encounters? What do you think? Um, so I think we'll both probably jump in on this also because Jennifer has sons who are, one just graduated college and one who's should, maybe should have been at college this year and, and took a year off. And so she may have a lot of thoughts on this as well. I think, um, I want to add a few things about the COVID conversation um, uh, that I think we might reflect upon. The first would be, you know, for a lot of the young people going to college this year, like the, um, the experience of the final semester of high school or the final term of high school or the final quarter of high school, it's often a time where like first or, you know, major sexual experiences happen and they like do a bunch of things that many of them probably did not do before getting to college. And there's a huge amount of anxiety among young people about the lack, their lack of sexual experience. And as Jennifer said with the previous example, um, their lack of being a skilled sexual partner. And I think that one of the challenges is that like that pressure can be mounting. I'll also say that like one of the great um, uh, 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 harms that we saw done to young people was harms uh, tied to sexual shame. Um, the uh, one young woman said to us, uh, you know, when talking about why she got so drunk before uh, sexual encounters, she said, well, alcohol to me before sex is like Novocaine before going to the dentist. Like it numbed her so she could get through it. And that numbing was partially a product of her own deeply you know, internalized sense of sexual shame, which was not her own deeply internalized sense of sexual shame. Instead, it was like the communities sort of pushing this sexual shame upon them. And so I think like having a harm reduction approach um, where we recognize that like, you know, is sex a risky behavior in terms of COVID? Well, yeah, but like choir practice is much riskier. And so, you know, we should probably ban um, choir, choir practice before we ban sex. And that as we navigate this moment, um, doubling down on a sense of sexual shame, doubling down on um, the idea of sex as a problem or sex as an inherent problem is something I think we shouldn't do. And instead think about drawing upon public health tools which consider what harm reduction really looks like. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you had more to, to add in. No, just, just to add on that there is a long tradition of harm reduction in relation to sex and HIV. And, and I think that there are many lessons that we can draw on for that. And there is um, a sort of moral panic about young people's sexual behavior that ebbs and flows in America. And we would not want this to be a moment that um, focuses or, or, or incites that moral panic. I just, um, there's so many things, so many forms of really acute suffering that uh, we see young people experiencing now um, and the ways in which the pandemic has exacerbated the inequality with some students 
renting houses in Hawaii to study together while other students are, um, you know, tripled up at home with spotty internet service or, you know, sitting outside a library so they can do their homework. So I, I'm like, there are many things that I am more worried about than sexually transmitted COVID. Thank you. Any, any final thoughts that you both want to add before we turn to questions? No, I'd love to hear. Oh, I, actually, I have one final thought, which is about sex education. So um, I want to see you all in, Al in Albany passing comprehensive sex education. New it, was, it was on the legislative agenda last year, and then COVID hit, and we didn't make it. But I'm part of the statewide coalition, and there is nothing more powerful in speaking to a senator than a young person. Um, I have brought both my kids to testify in Albany on other issues. So I know this from experience, but I think, you know, it, it is, there are nine states in America where by law sex ed must discriminate against queer people. Thankfully, New York is not one of those states, but New York is not a state where um, there's a mandate or funding for comprehensive sex education. And what that means is that rich kids and kids in progressive school districts get pretty good sex ed and poor kids, kids in rural areas don't. And so and that's an inequality that we could change. And so I would love to see Cornell students be part of the political organization that makes that happen this year. This is, this is gonna be our year. Great, so we've got a good um, slew of questions here and feel free to continue to submit questions as, as we go through some of them. So here's our first one. The descriptions of power as the ability to control access to or provide increased access to personal space, living area, et cetera, is, new, is a new idea for many. This, this person is asking you to delve a little bit more into that idea and help us think, think about it in terms of unequal power relationships or resources. So they give some examples, RA versus residents, over inebriated, access to shared or communal spaces, Sure, so there's a bunch of things we can think about here from institutional rules to who controls space to the idea that you don't really have to have power in order to use or exercise power. So, you know, Jennifer kind of highlighted that before where when she said, you know, men may not at times feel that powerful, but they may be able to use power. As an example of that, um, one of the uh, genderqueer students that we interviewed, they used they, them um, uh, pronouns, told us a story about how their partner, um, uh, who also identified as genderqueer, and they were both going through transitions, um, said to them, you don't think I'm beautiful. And in that moment, this was sort of their partner saying this because they didn't want to have sex all that frequently, and they were pressuring their partner into having sex. and. Um, that person who said, like, you don't think I'm beautiful, like, was not a necessarily, like, a powerful person, but it was an instance of an exercise of power that sort of hit deep, hit deep in, you know, where they knew what it felt like to not feel beautiful, particularly when going through a gender transition. And so when thinking about, and this is going to loop back to the actual answer to the question, um, uh, power and space, I think we might look at this at multiple levels. The first is, like, what are the institutional rules on campus about spaces, how they can be used, when they can be used, and what are the consequences for sexual assault? You know, one of the big, I think, wins of our uh, broader study was in getting campus spaces to be open 24 hours that were socializing spaces on Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights, um, and beyond. And the idea there was that, like, when students are at a party and they want to go somewhere, there's nowhere for them to go other than one another's rooms. And like the person who has a single is in a pretty empowered position and that tends to be a more senior student. So like, what could we do with institutional spaces to help address something like that? You know, the other thing is to think about power and other forms of inequality. So economic inequality, you know, um, people who are able to throw parties to tend to be people who can afford to buy liquor for other people. Even if they're charging at the door, they tend not to make all their money back. And so what are we doing with that? Well, you know, part of what we're doing is, you know, making sure that wealthier people 
have control over party space. And that may not mean like that they physically control more space than others, but insofar as they're suppliers for parties, this empowers them in important ways. And so when thinking about the usage of space, the institutional rules of space, we should ask how multiple forms of power inequalities intersect with that, how race, gender, sexuality, class, all are important and year in school um, to understanding control over that space, comfort in that space, and how we might create greater equalities around that. Great. Can you suggest ways that faculty might be able to engage students with some of your concepts and use curriculum infusion to bring the concepts of sexual projects, sexual citizens, citizenry, and sexual geography into their courses? I, you know, that is the beauty of a liberal arts education is that the goal is to promote critical thinking. So I think helping students think about power and how they fit into the world, um, you know, whether, and through the book, I mean, the book can fit in, in social science classes, it can fit in methods classes, it, it, um, gender and sexuality. So there's all kinds of ways in which um, the book itself could be used um, as part of the curriculum. But I think that the broader, um, the broader charge is that there are lots of places in the curriculum that intersect with um, what it means to be a good person, right? And so all of those, like we, as a parent, when you say to your kid, don't grab, use your words, that's a sexual assault prevention message, right? You just need to make the connections. And so similarly in the curriculum, all of those, whether it's political science or philosophy or social science, there are many opportunities for students to grapple with those fundamental questions about how we treat other people. And I think that all of those are opportunities to, um, to think critically about, uh, about including sex in, in, in those interactions. Not to mention art history. I mean, like the art history, art history is so full of um, representations of sexual assault. And so actually addressing that as opposed to letting it be seen as normal. Um, I think that there are many things, many ways that faculty could um, in incorporate this into the curriculum. Great. Are there any universities that you think are doing a pretty good job at addressing the problem? And what specifically are they doing? So, you know, Jennifer and I don't re didn't really do an assessment of the different programs that universities have done. And so I, I kind of hesitate to, um, you know, to point any ones out. I think, you know, there were interesting things going on at um, uh, Skidmore in terms of taking a restorative justice uh, framework for some of the adjudication. I don't know the overall success of that. It just it was something that we learned about over the course of, of this. I mean, one of the things that's been kind of the most exciting about the last um, nine months for this project has been seeing universities actually pick up this language and institute it within their own practice. And so, you know, for example, um, Stanford's Title IX office and sex education office recently constructed like an online quiz that people can take where they take that quiz and it helps them think about what their sexual project is um, and helps them reflect upon their sexual projects. And so, you know, there are things that are happening across campuses where, um, you know, uh, just as Jennifer said, like, what are we going to do in pedagogy in classrooms where you know, the, the, the book is not um, moralistic about the kinds of sex that people have, but it is pretty moralistic about how we treat each other when we have sex. And so this is a little bit of a shift in, in terms of like how we think about sex and morality. In, in one instance, you think about like, oh, is certain kinds of sexual morality good or bad? You know, we don't think about that, but we think about our fundamental obligation to respect other people's human dignity and treat them with dignity. And so seeing how that has become part of sex ed um, uh, uh, has been super exciting. And then I think, you know, um, trying to really push forward conversations about 
race and class and sexuality um, uh, in the sexual assault uh, sphere. What I mean by that is um, uh, we have a paper that's coming out, it's sort of in preprints uh, right now, it's about how sexual assault isn't one thing, it's many different things. So in that paper, we use a latent class analysis, which is sort of a, you know, a structural equation modeling, like an inductive process of figuring out kind of what's happening between a, a collection of variables. And what we, what we see in that is that like, you know, drunken assault is disproportionately experienced by white people. Um, and that's partially because white people drink more than African Americans and then Asian Americans. They drink about the same as uh, Hispanics. But like that insight is important because so much of the sexual assault education that we do is tied to alcohol. And we're not arguing that that's unimportant, but we would say that like, you know, in, in asking questions in the broader survey that Claude led, Claude Mellons led, um, you know, we noted that just a little over half of the students identified incapacitation as the mode of perpetration of their assault. In other words, that incapacitation was why they were assaulted. But it's important to note that that means that, you know, 45% of them said that incapacitation was not the reason that they were assaulted. And so we might begin to think about intimate partner violence and assaults that happen outside of drinking and that those kinds of experiences, unwanted touching, are experienced by different kinds of students. And so I think that the other thing that's exciting, and again, Celine here, I'm not pointing to any one university, but just saying like, thinking about how, um, you know, a multi-sectoral, multi-pronged approach where we think about race, class, gender, the different kinds of assaults that are happening and how they're experienced by different kinds of students or more likely to be experienced by different kinds of students is kind of where we're hoping to see and beginning to see some prevention efforts move. Terrific. So now a question on Greek life. Uh, so one, one sort of solution that resurfaces <laughs> is abolishing Greek, Greek life, um, particularly because it's really an environment ripe for many different inequalities to to play out. Um, so with regards to Greek life as a sexual geography of inequality, what are your thoughts on abolishing it? So first, I think it's important to remember not to universalize the white experience as everyone's experience, because really it's white Greek life that is a sexual geography of inequality. I mean, think about Kamala Harris's <clears throat> Alpha Kappa Alpha sorority sisters and, and the way that AKA has um, been uh, a, a sustaining network for black women in America or think about, so, so I think like, let's be more specific and note that we're talking about primarily white uh, Greek life. Um, if it wants to abolish itself, yeah, I think that that makes a lot of sense. I think that a, a top-down push to abolish it from outside seems to me like a non-starter. But yes, it is a it is a um, an institution that reproduces inequality at the same time that it's an institution that for people who are in it, um, many of them have very positive experiences. And so there, there's a, um, a, a deep commitment to propagating it. Um, it's not just a, a part of, it's not just the reproduction of, of sexual inequality, it reproduces labor market inequality, right? I mean, like, how do you get your internship through a lot, or how do you get your job on, uh, you know, in finance through, you know, older fraternity brothers? So um, it is a structure of inequality. Um, and I think that revealing that in ways that go beyond sex is part of a conversation about what would it look like to, to move towards inequality. But I think that, that that's something that will be more effective when it comes from within than without. So in the book, you talk about many different types of sexual assaults that play out. Um, and so one question that's come up here is, is there a need to rethink the naming of sexual assault as such if consensus over sex is often very um, ambivalent is the word that's used here. Um, the language of assault seems to antagonize one party of sexual action against the other. 
when the reality is, it is much more complicated in most cases. Um, so what do you, what are your thoughts on sort of the, con the word itself? And, and relatedly, I'll, I'll add in to sort of the word consent as well. I mean, I know that, that the focus is really on sort of deepening, adding other dimensions to a prevention that, that move beyond consent education, but um, sort of assuming that some, that, that, that is going to remain a part of, of, of the, of sort of education around the issue. Um, how can we think about consent, the word consent and, and the word sexual assault differently? Um, so, you know, we, we have a paper on this. Uh, um, uh, it's uh, titled, I didn't want to be that girl, the social risks of labeling um, and reporting sexual assault. And I'm going to get a little into the weeds of our own methodology here and then take a step back. So, you know, in um, survey research on sexual assault, you don't ask people, have you ever been raped? Um, uh, what you typically ask is, have you ever had sexual contact without your consent or agreement? Um, and the idea is that when trying to measure the thing, um, the label may come with some uh, uh, um, kind of burden for people. And so if you ask people on national surveys, have you ever been raped? fewer than 2% of the people will say that they have on national surveys. If you ask people, have you ever had non-consensual penetrative sex? You know, it'll be closer to 8% will say that they have. And so those two things are definitionally the same, um, but people aren't will, always willing to label the thing sexual assault. Um, we had one story that a woman told us where um, she was meeting uh, an ex-boyfriend that she really liked, where he'd said to her, you know, I really want to talk about my sister who recently got a cancer diagnosis and um, uh, they went into Morningside Park for you know, some privacy and to have this conversation. And then he started to make out with her and um, uh, uh, she was kind of really surprised. She was still attracted to him and liked him, but was like, what is going on? Like, I thought we were here to talk about your sister and her cancer diagnosis. Like, and eventually, you know, he uh, pushed her against a tree and she said, no, stop. And then um, brought her to the ground and um, he raped her. And when she told us this story, she did not tell it as a rape and she in fact was adamant that it wasn't. And she laughed later and about, you know, finding dirt on her body and, and, and then said like, well, you know, he must have thought when I said no stop, he meant up against the tree and it was uncomfortable and that's why he brought me to the ground. And she worked really hard not to use the words assault or rape. And in our study, when we ask people about their sexual experiences, we didn't ask them directly about assault. We asked them about, we like listened to their stories, asked them about consent, which Celine admittedly is, has, is also laden with things. And then um, as we categorize things, we categorize them not relative to the subjective label that people used, but instead the definitional label that we used. Okay. So now, with all of that side of methodological stuff in the background, um, do we need better terms for this? Do we need better terms for awkward sex, what students would call icky sex? Students also used the phrase rapey, like where they were like, I had sex that was rapey, and by that they meant that it was like rape, but not. Um, uh, like, and so that could mean any range of things. And so they're sort of struggling with uh, proper language um, here. In the question also, there's you know how we talk about people who did this. We avoid using the language of perpetrators in the book. Um, and the reason we do that is sort of, it's informed by racial scholarship um, of Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who talks about how um, you know, a major part of the um, uh, 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 progressive era was turning black people from people who committed criminal acts to criminals, like personality types. And perpetrators has a very similar char characteristic to it. Like it's a type of person versus an act that a person commits. I think that we do, you know, it would be, it, you know, the, as an ethnographer, we kind of like, we use the language of our subjects. And we try and work within and, you, and like interrogate that language where we highlight when they don't really describe something in one way and we describe it in another. 
we highlight you know, the kinds of words that they use and take seriously the moments where they say that something was quote unquote rapey. And rather than sort of infuse a range of judgment upon that about what they should be saying or how they should interpret what's happening, we instead have an approach based in like empathy and understanding. Great. So we've got a couple questions on sort of practical things that can be done to, um, to actually sort of get administrators on board um, with, in making these changes. So one, one person writes, as student life staff, I've been frustrated with how universities' decisions about dorms are, are mainly driven by profit. What are some effective and popular, popular among university administrators changes that you might suggest? Um, so I guess one part of the whole shift project, which we haven't described, is the community-based participatory research orientation. So it was, it was never our intention to do the research and then hand over a binder of recommendations to the university, because that would go with all the other binders of recommendations that they've gotten over the years about diversity and gender inclusion and stopping sexual harassment. There must be some special desk drawer where they're all sitting. And so we, um, from the beginning, in addition to having a, a panel of undergraduates who advised us on the research implementation, which was far and away the most fun part of the work, we had a panel of um, senior administrators, you know, stakeholders, people who shape the student experience from a, the undergraduate experience from across the university. And um, it was our, and this was Claude and me, sort of the, the leaders of the, the larger project, we were in conversation with them from the beginning about what we were finding. And then we talked together about what it might mean because they were the ones who understood the horizon of the possible. And I was, you know, to a person, they were all very committed to addressing sexual assault. I feel like there was a moment when the light bulb went off, um, the vice president for housing and dining who had, you know, he agreed to be on the, the um, institutional advisory board because he was a nice guy, but he had never thought about sexual, he had never thought about his work as sexual assault prevention. And as we started to talk about sexual geographies, he was the one who made the decision to keep the dining hall open all night because he got it. Um, and in the same way that I think that the dining hall workers are an important sort of informal part of the campus mental health system because they provide a sense of home and welcome to students. I think that's a little bit of a digression there, but, but so I think the fact that um, that was his decision because he was the one who had the power to make it. If we had come in and said, you should do this and you should do that, that never would have worked. So I think that um, a good faith effort to um, share the facts with the people who are the deciders and then figure out like, and, and then they're the deciders, right? Um, so uh, we were never in a position to tell anyone what to do. Um, and it was, I mean, I think that Columbia took an enormous risk with us, right? They gave us all this money. It was a lot of money. Um, and we had total scientific independence. And they're like, we'll be in touch. Let us know what you find. Um, so it was sort of the perfect setup as a researcher um, to do a, a moonshot level project where we really, um, we had institutional support when we needed it. So when Seamus ended up on page six of the New York Post, we had the whole comms team help us figure that out. Um, and the rest of the time, they just let us do our work. It was pretty great. That's great. So as here's the, the one question that's been added. Um, as you create programs on campus that empower students to feel confident in their choices uh, and their sexual projects to use your your term, um, which in, this this sort of building of confidence includes sexual po sex positivity. What are some ways that we can avoid conflating sex positivity with assault prevention? Yeah, that's, I mean, um, it's interesting in the book, we don't end up arguing for sex positivity. I mean, we don't argue against it. Um, but the position we sort of stake out is that what we need to provide is um, sex clarity. And um, so, uh, 
you know, we are, for people who want a sexual project of abstinence, that's a totally legitimate sexual project for us. Uh, we don't really have a strong view that like, um, uh, uh, we should be teaching particular ways of orienting to sex, sexual projects. Instead, we really focus on like how you're treating others within those projects. And so you know, the first thing I would say is like, I mean, I'm not personally against sex, sex positivity, but I, our, like, our approach is sexual education. Like people should just know about sex, how it works, um, what it means to be a respectful sexual partner, um, you know, some basic set of communication techniques and probably more than basic, um, and that there shouldn't be shame around sex. Uh, and I think that's a little different than sex promotion, um, uh, uh, which is maybe what I'm interpreting sex positivity to mean. Um, and that's probably not what the, the questioner meant by it, but um, we kind of have a little bit of an ambivalent uh, uh, stance as to um, you know, the kinds of things that we should promote in terms of people's sexual activity. We have a not at all ambivalent stance in terms of how people treat each other. And so I think that's how we can think through, you know, um, uh, uh, like sex ed as it should be kind of as like benign as driver's ed, right? Like, like it's just like a good thing to know to learn how to drive and it's a good thing to know to know how to have sex, right? And it, like it should be infused with like about that level of boringness in terms of its educational content. It should be very fun. like. When you're having it and you know another source of inequality that we haven't talked about that's tied to sexual projects is like the orgasm gap and the differences in sexual pleasure that are experienced um, by different kinds of people and so that certainly is something that uh, i'd say we think should be addressed but you know overall um i think that it's totally possible to do a kind of sex education as a form of um sexual assault prevention that isn't necessarily um, a sex promotion strategy. Okay, we've got a couple of questions that actually follow up on um, this topic of sex ed and and pornography. <coughs> so, what what's your perspective on the role of pornography in the relationship between porn and sexual violence? Part one, and then in another question. Um, in the book, you talk about how pornography plays a role in students' sexual education currently. Um, could you think about, think out loud about how campuses can challenge that influence with students who have already been exposed to years of pornographic images and films? So in my dream world, along with those suites for freshmen, um, people have an access have access to critical porn education because you know we have created a world in which in the absence of comprehensive sex education porn plays um an important role as a place where young people seek out information and it tends to, it ends up being information that is very distorted but um uh, but it's a place where people, where young people go to learn about sex because they don't feel like they have other sources, other better sources. So, um, and I don't think we can put the porn genie back in the bottle. So that wouldn't be my, that wouldn't be our goal. But I think that in the same way that like a very typical middle school project is to look, learn to look critically at advertising and to think about what advertising is selling you and to distinguish between the messages and advertising and the, you know, the value of the products that are advertised. I mean, at least that was like a middle school project at my kid's school. Um, I, there is a critical porn education curriculum um, that's been evaluated. It's been developed by somebody at the Boston University School of Public Health. And like, I think that's great. I, it, or even if you're not going to use that curriculum, I think the broader message of acknowledging that like people look at pornography and helping them learn to distinguish between paid actors acting out someone else's fantasies and what real bodies look like and what real sex feels like um or the range of things that that, that it can feel like um is is important that's a that's a that's a critical thinking skill that we can help them 
develop. Um, and it's not a great way to learn about sex. So I think that if that's, if that's what you, that's your source of information, then you can end up with a very distorted sense of, um, of what women want, um, of what people's bodies are supposed to look like. Um, but I don't think the, the, the solution is to try to keep kids from looking at porn because they're always going to be one step ahead of us in terms of figuring out parental controls. Like, and I say that as a parent. I mean, and I, I, this is a story I have permission for my kids to tell. One of them got in trouble for violating the school's appropriate use policies um, for the computer. And I said to him, I said, I hope you weren't looking at porn on your school computer. And he said, no, that's what my home computer is for. And he was in fourth grade. So like, and you know, I think that sexual curiosity is natural and I wasn't super psyched to hear that, but you know, we talked about it. So you've talked a bit about how it's been exciting to sort of to hear feedback about the book from universities um, and, and their efforts to, to start applying your recommendations. Have you, have you had any feedback from other groups or st more specific stakeholders within universities, for example, um, you know, going back to Greek life, um, other student groups, um, even alums? So, I mean, probably pushing a little bit of a different direction. I think um, where we're kind of pushing to next is like high schools um, and um, it's not that universities are too late, but they're quite late to be doing this. And in across national surveys and in the own survey that's associated with the study that we did that was led by Claude Mellons, you know, we find that one of the strongest predictors for being assaulted in, in college is having been assaulted in high school. And that is consistent with many other studies. And so, you know, when we say the university setting is too late, what we partially mean is that like many people come to college and university settings with assault experiences already. And those people are more likely to have assault experiences in college as well. And so, you know, I think one place to think about is like, what is happening, you know, when Americans, young people today, they're not having sex at younger ages than their parents were, but they're still, you know, about 50% of them are having sex before they get to college age. Like, there's something we have to be doing much earlier. And so I think that's one place where, you know, Jennifer and I are starting to talk more broadly, more broadly with people in those institutions. The second thing I'll say, and it's, it's sort of a parallel comment, is that like we don't have great data on national sexual assault rates, but it seems like um, women of college age who are not in college have a higher rate of assault than women of college age who are in college. So, you know, some of the women who are of the greatest risk of assault, like, are not in these institutions. And, you know, you look at a place like Cornell and you think the incredible resources that Cornell can throw at this problem and all of the people, the, like, incredible people who are working on this and helping students, like, colleges, it don't seem like they're a particularly dangerous place. They are probably pretty protective. And, the longer that people are in college, the less likely they are to be assaulted. The, 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 you know, the risk of assault is the highest in the first um, 90 days of being here, really the first year. And so you know, I think it's also important to think about you know, all of the other populations out there from high school students to people who, are, who do not have the advantages of going to college and what their experiences are and how we might use some of these insights to speak to that um, and to speak to some of the more precarious people um, who are experiencing assault at even higher rates. And that's some of the places I'd like to kind of see, um, I don't know that we will, we're probably not gonna lead that conversation, but I'd love to see this conversation go in those two places. I think we have time for one more question. Um, so realizing that you know your your book is on an elite uh, focused on an elite institution in the US um you you've talked a little bit about that but how might your findings 
be applicable to other or applicable or not to other schools within the US and beyond. So other countries um, as well it's from the audience. So obviously, um, the, the Columbia and Barnard um, environment is very particular, but the questions that we raise, and, and in particular, the, the framework, so the notion that, that students, all people really, need to develop some clarity around their sexual projects, that um, social institutions can do more to promote recognition of sexual citizenship, and that um, we need to understand the sexual geographies so we can think about how to modify them in ways that are more equal. Like that is a set of questions that can be asked at any institution, um, whether a high school or higher education in another state or country. So I, I feel like the conceptual framework travels. Obviously, there's a lot of ethnographic particularity to the story. I mean, that, that's as, just as a broader comment for any social scientist in the room, like that is what ethnographic generalizability means. It doesn't mean that like the way people talk about sex in Morningside Heights is going to be the same as anywhere else. It means that the, the questions that you bring to understanding it are questions that are useful to ask in other contexts. This has been so great. Thank you so much for sharing these insights with us and, and having this conversation. And, uh, we will look forward to seeing the many transformations that, that uh, the universities will make as a result. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you to everyone for joining in, to Nina and to Kim and to um, John, and of course, Celine, to you for this. It's really been a pleasure to be here. Sorry we can't be in beautiful Ithaca and um, uh, be there with you, but um, we really appreciate you all making the time for this. Yeah, we're very grateful. I know that this is the time when everything is hard. And so to organize extra events, um, it's both more important in terms of creating a feeling of community, but also an extra burden. And so we really were very, very appreciative. Um, thank you. I wish we could be there. Go Big Red. <laughs> thank you. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank you.